Hey, I want to thank you all for coming out today to hear, I think, it's go what's going to be a very exciting program about a character in Longfellow's Tales of the Wayside Inn, the Spanish Jew, who is actually based on an actual um, character who lived and breathed in Boston. And, and uh, Joyce has been uh, doing a lot of research on this, so I think that will be very interesting. And hopefully she will tell us about how it was that you came to be interested in this particular character. But let me just t uh, read something, a little something about Joyce herself, because I don't think she's going to include this. Um, Joyce is from Hopkinton, a teacher and graduate of Yale with a BA in English. She has worked as a research assistant in areas as diverse as pharmacology, patent law, and cognitive psychology, where she helped design and conduct intelligence tests. She has taught many things from violin to Hebrew and homeschooled her three children for many years. Quite a, quite a, quite a lady. As an amateur researcher, she read and questioned previous accounts of Isaac Edrahi. For the past year, she has delved into newspapers, advertisements, and courtroom accounts and consulted with historical specialists to document this peculiar and flamboyant man who is many things to many people, but who is remembered for the one identity he did not choose for himself, that of Longfellow's Spanish Jew. Um, I would like to say a few things after your presentation, so I'll take it back from then. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, and first of all, thank you to the Sudbury Historical Society for their faith in me in, in uh, setting this up. As you may have gathered uh, from her, her very nice introduction, I've done quite a number of things, and history is not one of them. Um, I am a rank amateur, and if there's anything to be taken from that, it is that the sorts of things that I found, anybody could find by going on the internet and also pestering archivists and librarians. Um, so I hope that sometime that you will have the enjoyment as well of coming up with an idea to pursue and finding it to be such a juicy topic as I have found uh, this one. Um, so I hope that my findings about Isaac Edrahi will be informative and entertaining. Um, I also have a few qualms about it because anytime you go into the area of ethnic stereotyping, you're on thin ice. And um, there are some things that I would have qualms about uh, presenting if I were not Jewish myself. And even so, um, it's a little shaky. So uh, I, I hope you enjoy it. There may be some things that uh, you may squirm at a little bit. So that's sort of how I feel about it at times. Um, we will have questions and answers afterwards. So um, hold your objections, and I would like to hear your breadth of opinion later on. Okay. Now, um, as to how I got onto this topic, um, I was over at the Wayside Inn here in Sudbury, and uh, Rich and I were having a discussion. This is Rich Natowski, who's on the staff there at the mill. And uh, he mentioned to me that there were two Spanish Jews connected with the Wayside Inn. And I said, well, I know there's one. There's uh, you know, Isaac Edrahi, the Spanish Jew. And he said, no, there was a second one. Even before that, there was a man named Joseph Lopez, he, who's a merchant, merchant and um, he uh, did some trading with the Wayside Inn. And we have a receipt from back 1790, what? Was it 1795? 81. 1781, wow. Um, so he said that he was wondering whether the two Spanish Jews, the real people, might have ever met up or been part of the same um, Jewish community. Because they are both Spanish Jews, that means that's what we would call these days Sephardic Jews, means that their ancestors were from Spain uh, prior to the, um, the Spanish Inquisition. Um, and that's a particular group of Jews that have some distinctive, um, dis distinctive culture, distinctive language and food. Um, religiously, not so different from other Jews, but they're really a group of their own that has a lot of pride in their background. So he was wondering whether they might have met each other, and I said, I'll look into it. Um, <laughs> he didn't know what he was getting into. Um, in fairly short order, I found out that the age difference between them was such that it was extremely unlikely that their paths would have ever crossed. But almost immediately, I came up with some things about Isaac Edrahi that were so different 
from what was already on record, what was known, and I realized that nobody had looked into him very carefully since the days of the internet. And that since newspapers have gone online and so on, an awful lot has come to light that's substantially different, that sheds a very different light on what's known about him. And that's what I want to present. So the picture that you see up here is the same as the picture that you will find in the parlor of the Sud Sudbury, uh, the Wayside Inn in Sudbury, where they have the pictures of the seven characters who are the storytellers in Tales of a Wayside Inn. They were all based on real people. And um, all of the others are formal portraits. And then there's this one drawing. Um, and this is the most that was known about him till very recently. And what I would like uh, to update you to is the first thing that I came across on the internet was that uh, what I think is a gorgeous portrait of him by Asher Durand, who's a known artist. He was the founder of the Hudson River School. He ended up being a landscapist. I think he should have stayed with portraiture, actually. Um, but I hope that this will show the difference between what was known and what is known. I hope to add a lot of color to what you understand about him, because I think he really did live a very colorful life. Um, to give a little bit of background, um, Longfellow, some of you may have memorized his poems in school, and others may have hardly heard of him. Um, he was the premier American poet of the mid-1800s. Um, he was tremendously popular. He was absolutely beloved. Um, he was, that's how he looked in his later years. And uh, he was really, even his appearance, he was so, somewhat of an icon. So he's had two stamps issued. Um, bonus points if you remember the first stamp coming out. <laughs> and uh, he wrote such popular favorites as Paul Revere's Ride. Anyone here um, memorized that in school? Yes. Oh, a handful. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of you who memorized it are of a particular generation because in subsequent years his poetry sort of fell out of favor. I hope to revive a bit of interest in him here. Um, All right, so when he started off, he was born in 1807, educated at Bowdoin College, and um, his area of interest was modern languages. He traveled in, um, in Europe, and he was initially primarily a translator. He hold, held uh, professorships at Bowdoin and eventually at Harvard, and um, he loved those European works. Dante and so on, and most of his, his work was devoted to translating. Little by little, he got into um, his own poetry as well. And um, by his middle years, he actually retired from Harvard, and he spent his time full time writing poetry, which was quite an achievement at his time. He may have been the only person of that period who actually was successful enough to make his living doing that. Um, well, while he was in Europe, he learned a lot um, about the literature of different cultures. And um, he developed an interest also in Near Eastern li literature. He had a mentor who was um, a Semitic scholar. So um, he expanded his interests well beyond Europe. And in the mid-1850s, he wrote a couple of poems that had to do with Jews. And one was about um, an angel and sort of his, how he was drawn to the mystical old Jewish tales. Um, and then another one was the uh, poem about the Jewish cemetery at Newport. Now, Newport, Rhode Island was a very, very old Sephardic, meaning Spanish Jewish community. And he wrote of his feelings <coughs> for this, the, um, the Jews who had lived there formerly, um, and especially their history of persecution. And he wrote in a very, very compassionate way. So even in the 1850s, he had a strong feeling for the plight of the Jews um, and the, uh, had a connection with the Spanish Jews in particular, um, and in part because they were kind of a bridge between um, Christian culture and Muslim culture because they were in Spain with the Moors and so on, and he was drawn to all of those, all of those cultures. Um, now, when he wrote Tales of a Wayside Inn, that was 1863. Um, he started in 1862, and it was, in many ways, the worst of times. Um, the country was in civil war, and uh, he was uh, 
coming out of a very deep depression. His wife had died in a terrible, terrible accident where her dress had caught fire. Um, and he had tried to put the fire out. He had gotten badly burned as well. Um, it was not only a tragic incident, but absolutely traumatic for him. That was in 1861. He was in deep depression, didn't feel that he could ever write poetry again after that. Um, then he started in 1862, he just started to pull the pieces back together. Um, he went back to some things that he had published, some other things that he hadn't finished, went back to his beloved translations, things that did not require him to break new emotional territory, and he started to pull them together, and he had the idea to create a fiction of a group of friends meeting at an inn and telling each other stories. And by doing this, he could draw together all the stories that he was working on and put them within a larger framework. Now, it turned out it really wasn't such a fiction that he was uh, creating because, in fact, three of his friends were regulars at the Red Horse Tavern, which is what the Sudbury Inn was then called. Um, they would go there for the summers, and they would spend very nice time there together in the parlor. parlor. So he put those three friends in the story, along with three other people who he knew from other places. And um, so he concocted this group of six friends and um, had them meet in the Wayside Inn. And when the weather was bad or it was nighttime, they would sit around the fire in the parlor in a very cozy way, and they would tell each other stories. And it, this was the setting that allowed him to bring in stories from many, many different cultures. So he did this by introducing three characters from cultures other than the majority, white Anglo-Saxon, which were many of his friends. There was his good friend, uh, Luigi Monti, who was an Italian refugee translator. Um, there was Ola Bull, who was an, um, a uh, Scandinavian violinist. And there was Isaac Edrihi, the Spanish Jew. Um, so let's take a look at Tales of a Wayside Inn. In the prelude, he introduces all the characters. And let's listen. Rich will come up here to read. And you'll see how he introduces the character of the Spanish Jew. A Spanish Jew from Alicant, with aspect grand and grave, was there, vendor of silks and fabrics rare, an attar of rose from the Levant. Like an old patriarch, he appeared, Abraham or Isaac, or at least some later prophet or high priest, with lustrous eyes and olive skin, and wildly tossed from cheeks and chin the tumbling cataract of his beard. His garments breathed a spicy scent of cinnamon and sandal blent, like the soft aromatic gales that meet the mariner who sails the Malacus and the seas that wash the shores of Celebes. All stories that recorded are by Pierre Alphonse he knew by heart, and it was rumored he could say the parables of Sandabar and all the fables of Pilpe, or if not all, the greater part. Well-versed was he in Hebrew books, Talmud and Targum, and the lore of Kabbalah. And evermore, there was a mystery in his looks. His eyes seemed gazing far away. And if in vision or in trance, he heard the solemn sackbut play and saw the Jewish maidens dance. So we see that is a very colorful portrayal of somebody who critics said he's not very much like the way real Jews are. Um, I mean, it doesn't say anything about his observance, and he, he's, he's very exotic, he's very Middle Eastern. Um, later critics, particularly ones who are of the um, more the European Jews, just felt that this wasn't, well, it's very nice, it's very complimentary, but it doesn't seem like a real person. Um, so we'll see how real it was, but it's a, it's a very um, visual dis description, and interestingly enough, also has the aroma. And several times he mentions that the Spanish Jew has this sort of cinnamon-like scent that evokes the East. Um, and people thought he was being metaphorical, um, that it just showed that he was, had a very favorable view. They said, well, he's kind of overdoing it, but that's what he, that must be what he meant. Well, you'll see when you get to know Isaac Edrihi that he did have a lot to do with some aromatic things. Um, and the fact that this is so visual, um, when 
Um, when Longfellow was asked, well, who are these characters? Are they real characters? He wrote back to somebody, and he listed characters one by one. And then when he got to Edrihi, he said, Edrihi, whom I have seen as I have painted him. And painted is really the oper operative word here because almost anywhere Isaac Edrihi went, people seemed to want to draw or paint him. Even in Tales of a Wayside Inn, there's one point where um, the characters are sitting about in the morning, and one of them is while the Italian is whiling away the time drawing a picture of Edrihi at the Red Horse in Sudbury. So given that he was so um, visible a person, it's hard to believe that within two generations he had fallen into utter obscurity, so that of the many characters in the, in the tales, he was actually the least known. Um, now, let's see. So these are the, some of the features that Longfellow mentioned. And interestingly, in the, in the tales of A Wayside Inn, most of the characters, although they were friends of Longfellow's, most of them are not referred to by name. They're called the poet, the theologian, um, the, 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 uh, um, the young student, and so on. Once in a while, they're referred to by, by name. Edrihi is called Edrihi three times, more than anybody's called by name, and he gets four stories, which is more than anybody else got. Um, his stories are of angels and of kings. They're set in faraway places. They have a lot of exotic sounding names in them. This is an illustration from the first edition. No, oh, no, it's not a first edition, but it is an early illustration um, showing his first tale. Now, some of the tales come from Jewish sources, but they're not what we would often think of as biblical tales. One of them, by the by, does mention Sol King Solomon, but mostly they're set further away and uh, actually more, more modern than, than the ancient biblical tales. And mo mostly they're more mystical. So when he was first um, written about again, he was rediscovered by um, a writer named uh, John Van Skoik who wrote a book called Characters of Tales of a Wayside Inn which I came across in a bookstore not too long ago, and I read it with some interest because I thought, ah, Spanish G, what's this all about? Um, and that was before we even got onto this wonderful topic. Um, and he was so pleased because there was no known picture of Isaac Edrihi, and he discovered this picture, which is now up in the Wayside Inn. He provided it to them. He must have been absolutely thrilled because before they didn't know what he looked like, and as you see, he does have an exotic look about him. Um, now, at the time that this book was written, this was 1939, um, this is a summary of what was known about him. Um, born in Amsterdam, 1811. This is good to remember because actually, he does claim that he's from other places. He does seem to have been born in Amsterdam. Um, and then these things that you've known. Now, his father was a person of note, very well-known person in Europe. He was a Moroccan-born Jew. Um, he lived in England, in Amsterdam, in um, France for a while. And he was a, he was a scholar, and he traveled about, and he made a point to meet prominent people wherever he went and get letters of recommendation from him, from them. And then when he wrote books, they ended up in his, he made sure to go back to them and sell them uh, his books. And they ended up in his, their libraries so that his books have had actually quite a good shelf life because they ended up in libraries of wealthy people. And then when they passed on, they got donated to libraries and so on. If you read the books, the quality doesn't quite hold up, but we'll get into that later. Um, so then when Isaac came to the United States, we don't know exactly when that is, but it was sometime in the early 1840s, his goal was to republish his father's work, which he eventually did in the 1850s in Philadelphia and in Boston. Uh, the main work was about the, um, the ten tribes, the fate of the ten, the ten lost tribes of Israel. And um, this was actually an area of a lot of conjecture and phenomenal interest outside of the Jewish community. Um, there were books written, literally many, many books over the centuries from the time of the European discovery of America as to whether the Native Americans were from among the Israel's ten lost tribes. This seems not very plausible to us, but people were fascinated. Is whenever any group was discovered, it's like, oh, are they one of the 10 lost tribes? 
huge numbers of books written on this topic. So when Isaac's father was going around speaking on this, he attracted quite a lot of interest. Um, and then Isaac spoke about how um, he republished his work, and um, Van Skoik talks about him as having a great deal of filial devotion, that he wasn't so much of a scholar as his father, but his, his abiding passion was to make sure that his father's work was reprinted in America. So that's the expectation that I had, was that he was going to have that sort of attitude. But when I read the preface that he wrote in the book that he printed in Boston, he mainly was complaining about how much everything had cost. <laughs> and it just had a very different tone. He didn't say anything about his father, which I was interested in. Mainly, he seemed to be answering some unasked questions about why things were costing so much. So that put it in my, in my mind to doubt what, what his motives are or why he was saying things. So I came in with an attitude of complete skepticism, which ended up being very productive. Um, and so a lot of what Van Skoik knows about Isaac Edrahi was provided in Edrahi's own words in his note to the reader in the um, book that he published in Boston, meaning that he was just taking his word for it, which could only go so far. So now we're going to take a look at Isaac's life as I have discovered it um, through newspapers from England in the 1830s. So he's a young man here. Um, at first, he's in his early 20s. And we will see what sorts of things he was up to. Um, so he eventually, by his uh, later teens, he was in England. And he was helping his father run a, some sort of tobacco stand or tobacco shop, um, which his father did in addition to other things. And um, from time to time, Isaac, young Isaac would set himself up as a Turkish importer, of Im um, a Turkish merchant of imported goods. Um, all right, so this I would condense, but honestly, it's too good. I couldn't, I couldn't break it up, and I love the way they wrote back then. This is from the Brighton Guardian in England, October 1833. Yesterday morning, a great deal of interest was created in the immediate neighborhood of the town hall by a rumor that the Turkish Jew, who has been flaunting about this town for the last few weeks, smoking innumerable cigars and taking inordinate quantities of snuff, to the admiration of the women and the envy of all the men, was to be brought before the magistrates on a charge of horse stealing. The prisoner was placed at the bar dressed as usual in a green silk cloak, a white flowered silk turban, a white cotton vest with blue stripes, encircled by a red handkerchief, the whole not quite so clean as it should be, considering the prisoner was a gentleman. I mean, gentleman. He is rather a handsome man, with black curly hair, an aquiline nose, black whiskers and mustachios, a good set of teeth, a pair of fine black eyes, and an olive complexion. He is, we believe, of the Jewish persuasion although he complained of the Israelites as being his bitterest enemies. His dress has made him conspicuous and his deeds notorious, as the following particulars will testify. And then it mentions that uh, James Tuff, the innkeeper of the Spanish Inn, stated that on Monday afternoon, he found the prisoner quite at his ease, acting the fine gentleman, talking to the company, and in fact, the lion of the place. Before I go on, I want to point out, this is a person that um, Longfellow made into a storyteller. I think we know why. Here he is in his early 20s. He goes into an inn. He's immediately the center of attention. He absolutely loves it, and people find him riveting. Um, I will summarize the rest. It was not only horse stealing. A whole number of innkeepers and townspeople were up in arms about him. He had been about town, staying in hotels, and um, eating meals in restaurants, and not paying. And he would go from one place to another, not pay his bill, but he would generally leave something behind and say, oh, I was coming back. And then he was going around, some of his, his father's friends complained because he had gone to them, pressured them for money, or pressured them to, to lend him items. He would borrow items, say, like a nice old book from them. And then he'd go to a hotel where they would start pressuring him to pay the bill, and he would leave the nice, valuable old book, and he'll be, I'll be right back, and then he would go stay somewhere else. And so on this went, and they had a whole line of things against him, and, uh, but he always had an excuse and had a way of talking his way out of it. Um, however, 
as he was making his accusations, um, oh, we have a bit of dialogue to dramatize this. We have two Lees to come up. This is the judge. This is Isaac Edgerton. <laughs> How do you maintain yourself? I don't rob nobody. Why, sometimes I sell coffee and cigars, and when I sell cigars, get a permit for it. I'm a merchant, and I sell tea, coffee, cigars, auto of roses, and amulets. But I've sold no cigars lately, but coffee. Whom to? I don't recollect. You can't recollect? Give me two or three hours and my breakfast first. Where do you get the coffee? Oh, my dear sir. You buy it from one shop and sell to another? Yes, exactly so. <laughs> How have you lived this past fortnight? How I could. I sold an amulet at the turnpike gate. Thank God I do nothing that they can inform against me. I was here before with my father, who has a long beard. He wrote a book and got the Duke of Sussex and all the others to subscribe to it. We are not such rogues and blackguards and swindlers, but all the Jews have been saying I was a swindler, so that on Thursday evening I had to sleep in the street. I will bring an action against Mr. Abrahams and Mr. Solomon for defamation. I would have sold two to three thousand pounds worth of goods by now, but the Jews have spoilt it for me. There is no doubt that you live by swindling. As you have confessed sleeping in the open air, I shall commit you to one month of hard labor for vacancy. And in the meantime, see if a good case shall not be brought up against you. I will write my father. I will contact my lawyer, Mr. Faithful. He's very much respected in this town. Thank you. <laughs> and in the, uh, in the report on convicted vagrants from Brighton from the next month, we see the following rather unfortunate uh, entry that says, Edrahi, age 22, Jew, his character unknown, but suspected of swindling. <laughs> well, this sort of scenario was played out at least twice more in the next couple of years. Very similar situations where he would be brought up on charges and the courtroom would be literally full of people who had grievances against him. Different towns, different years. 1836 in Newcastle, um, that they say that he's uh, um, practicing a system of deception and petty swindling, setting himself up as a Turkish merchant, and so on. Um, Karen, up. And uh, then they, they, he ended up being acquitted eventually, but he, he, when he was, he was about to be held in jail, this is what the scene was. When about to be taken to Durham jail in one of the coaches, handcuffed to a sailor. His grotesque appearance caused no small merriment to a crowd of spectators who had assembled to watch his exit from town. <laughs> and then once again, he was brought up for uh, um, obtaining money under false pretenses. It says the room was nearly filled with tradesmen whom he succeeded in gulling. And they said that he introduced himself to one person and another and by different identities. To one, he was Turkish. To one, he was Moroccan. To one, he was the Honorable Sidney Burke. Um, and uh, the outcome of that one was that he was imprisoned for four months, including hard labor. That was 1838. And sometime not long after that, for some reason, he left the country. Um, so the next we hear of him, um, there is Asher Durand is an American painter, and he was, went to learn portraiture and study Ram, Rembrandt and a number of other painters, and he, was, and he ended up in Florence. He was depressed, his trip wasn't going well, and he was homesick. Um, he went out to the street in desperation looking for something to paint and found what he called the Hawking Turk, a Turk selling knickknacks on the street, and he invited him to, to paint him, and for it, he, pay, he uh, paid him two amulet, he bought from him two amulet purses, because that was one of his sidelines, was, was uh, selling amulets. And this was the painting that was the result, which I have to say I absolutely love. Um, now, Ed, um, Asher Durand was not the only artist who wanted to paint him, and uh, there were two others around the same period who um, are lesser known, but according to some records of exhibits, 
painted somebody named Isaac Edrahi, identified in the title as either the Moroccan or the Turk. Um, and so there were circulating in the, some exhibits in New York City, there were actually three different portraits of Isaac Edrahi b around the time that he arrived or, b or before he already was, was uh, being widely seen as um, a subject for portraits. Um, in addition to this, I've been looking through online and found a number of things that could be him, and I leave it to your judgments whether they are or not. Um, this th was identified as a Moroccan Jewish peddler of, in England. And then this one was painted by a, um, a German artist, and I will point your attention to the figure on the right and take a look what looks like almost like a cane is in fact a pipe, right? We go back. Right? And actually, the painter mentioned that the pipe and um, other things, that was her, his own clothing, and it was Edrahi's own clothing and props. So I don't know how convincing you find that, but take a look at all of them together. And uh, the two on the left are known to be Isaac Edrahi. The two on the right I just picked up from out there on the internet. Uh, give me your opinion afterwards whether you think they might be him or not. Um, all right, so now we're getting to the point that he's going to make his appearance in America. Um, and actually, the first record that I found of that was 1845, when um, actually Longfellow meets him, before I find any other sources. Now, Longfellow was not the venerable man with the beard back then. He looked more like this. He was a bit of the young poet himself. He and Edrahi were about three or four years apart. They weren't much difference in age. And so, and Edrahi came over, um, so he would have been about 35. And this is what Longfellow writes about him. My dear Tom, our imaginations are getting quite kindled about the East. Yesterday, we brought home to dine with us a living Arab with tunic and crimson velvet fez cap who came into my lecture room to get subscribers for a book of travels and sell pastilles du soleil. These are uh, harem pastilles or aromatic sols to be burned like incense. I made him break the law of the Karman by drinking iced champagne. And after dinner, we smoked and drank coffee under the apple tree in the garden. He looked very picturesquely stalking among the piazzas, and I suspect enjoyed it as much as we did, the good Saeed Edrahi. I am much mistaken if it was not the pleasantest day he has yet passed in America. It seemed to be putting us more in rapport with you just now to be sitting beside a Muslim. Little Charlie was highly delighted on being called a master boy in Arabic by this, poor, by this moor of Morocco. So evidently, Isaac Edrahi does a rather um, a rather convincing imitation of an Arab or Muslim. That's how he was passing himself off when he first came to America. What I would love to know is how he ever explained it to Longfellow that he was actually Jewish, because we know he met him as an Arab, he put him in the poem as the Spanish Jew. Something must have happened in those 17 years in between to disabuse him of his, his initial notion, and somehow, Longfellow did not seem to feel deceived. He must have thought it was interesting. He used Isaac Edrahi to bring both of those cultures together in Tales of a Wayside Inn. Um, but I would love to know how Isaac actually explained that. Um, so then um, we see in the news, a Boston newspaper shortly thereafter, uh, Isaac Edrahi is um, informing the public that he is receiving subscriptions for a historical work by his father, and that it has been liberally patronized by a number of um, eminent persons, among them Professor H.W. Longfellow. So he's obviously capitalizing on the friendship. Um, let's see. All right, so during this time he traveled about. He didn't stay in Boston. Um, he moved to Cincinnati, which, where there was a nascent uh, Jewish community. And Isaac Edger, he got married. He married a Jewish woman who was also born in Europe. Uh, her name was Hannah Myers. 
and they stayed married together all their lives. I would love to know her point of view of this. <laughs> Even more so, you'll find out. Um, but yes, uh, so he was in Cincinnati for a while, and then he continued to travel about, and he had these two sidelines that he pursued. One was selling subscriptions for his father's work to be published, and the other was selling amulets. Now here we have two actual, um, these are called handbills. These would have been things that were either posted or that he would have handed out as he was traveling around. Um, thank you for the various organizations that provided these for, to me. Um, now I'm going to have uh, our Edrahi come up and he's going to read, uh, so this is a sort of compilation of several ads, of the sorts of claims that he was making for his amulet. Notice, Mr. J. Edrahi has the honor of visiting the city of New Orleans and having had great success in the sale of his amulet, announces that he is now in receipt of a fresh supply from his father, the British consul at Jerusalem, <clears throat> and now offers them to the citizens of this place. This amulet is deemed an almost certain preventative of contagious diseases. This amulet is a berry that grows upon a tree on Mount Lebanon and in a botanic garden near Jerusalem, which is no humbug and which may be ascertained by an examination of the different books of medicine. This article is patronized and held in great regard by the queens of England, France, and Naples, and has likewise acquired universal patronage in the eastern cities and by the Congress at Washington. Now, we may well laugh about this, but the fact was that there were epidemics that were rife in those years. Every few years, epidemics would come through, scarlet fever, yellow fever, cholera. Um, people were living in increasing concentration in cities as industrialization proceeded, and they didn't really have modern sanitation, so these diseases were of tremendous concern. They didn't really know what caused a lot of them, and people were very, very scared. So as silly as it seems to us, he wouldn't have continued to pursue this as he did for at least 30 or 40 years unless he was having some measure of success. Um, and if we think about things that are um, remedies that are offered today, oh, you know, new age things. I'm not saying that they're all wrong. Some of them are, but there are things that have interesting aromas or um, don't work on you directly or, or magnetically or whatever. And people think, well, maybe they'll work. They certainly won't do me any harm. I might as well try. And he apparently had some measure of success. Um, so uh, I found this in a history book, and they were speaking of the cholera epidemic in Columbus, Ohio. One of the curious accompaniments of the epidemic was the appearance of no ends of quacks, professing the power of cure and prevention. One of those who visited Columbus called himself a native of Morocco and peddled about the streets what were called highly aromatic amulets, which were said to have almost sure preventive and preservative powers of cholera, scarlet fever, and contagious diseases. Now I have to admit to you there, Isaac Edrahi was not mentioned. I, I'm not, I can't prove to you that that was the same person. I leave you to your judgment. Um, so he continued, he traveled a lot. He traveled from Massachusetts as far south as New Orleans, as far west as um, Michigan, and uh, Cincinnati. He covered a lot of the populated United States at the time. <clears throat> he mentioned many reasons for needing money in his ads. He said that he needed to support his wife who was ill, may have been true. Um, he also apparently uh, suffered a rather disastrous fire at his home at which all of his belongings were burned. Um, and so in many ads, he has an appeal for mon money. Um, he says that he lost $800 worth of possessions in the fire, which I think was a lot back then. Um, so now we continue on to 1852, and uh, yes, we have um, him making pronouncements on things, according to his lectures he was giving. A real-life Turk, born in Constantinople, is sojourning in Cincinnati and expresses himself well pleased with that city. The one wife system, however, he abhors as unworthy of so great a country and so excellent a government. 
Now, when an interesting tidbit would come out in one newspaper, editors of other newspapers would see it, and then they would run it in their newspapers as well. So this one got picked up by at least four papers between New York uh, State and Texas. In other words, it went viral. <laughs> Um, now here, uh, later in 1858, we find him in another sort of enterprise altogether. An unfaithful Turk. For some time, a woman has called daily at the police office, inquiring for one Isaac Edrahi, a Turk, who, she says, was to meet her in this city. He formerly lived in New Orleans, she in Boston. He made an appointment to meet her here some time since and returned to Turkey. She left Boston and came on, according to agreement, but the faithless Turk has not yet made his appearance. By the way, that was from the New York Post. They were supposed to meet up in New York and leave from there to Turkey. Um, meanwhile, he actually had some success in getting his, the works published. Um, he published in Philadelphia in 1853, and then 1858, he published an even more substantial work um, in Boston. And the name of it was K History of the Capital of Asia and the Turks, uh, with some other things further down. Um, and if you looked at it, it in fact was several books bound together. Um, a couple of things on Turkey and Asia, and it says at the bottom in very small print, Son of, it says, reprinted for Isaac Edrahi, son of the late British consul at Jerusalem. And the date of it is 5618, which, by the way, was the Hebrew date. Um, I think that the reason the English date wasn't there was I think the publishers had some qualms about the authenticity of this publication. Uh, the reason I say this is that you notice that Moses Edrahi's name, the author, does not appear on the title page. It actually was helpfully written in by some libra baffled librarian. You see it's in, in ha handwritten. Um, in fact, the uh, name of the publisher does not appear on the title page, which is rather unusual. Only, only the city. It appears on the reverse in extremely small print, which I did not bother to reprint here. Um, so, was Isaac's father really the British consul in Jerusalem? You can find that out online, and I did. Um, there is still a British consul in, consulate in Jerusalem, and they have a history page. And his father actually did go to Jerusalem, 1840 to 1842, after which he passed away. And he was most definitively not the British consul at Jerusalem. <laughs> so as I was discovering this, these things, I said to Rich, you know, I just don't believe anything this guy says. How do we even know that these books that he's putting out were his father's. I mean, I know the thing about the 10 tribes, okay, his father put that out in England, but what about the rest of it? Looks like it's in a different style entirely, and when was his father ever in Turkey anyway? And Rich said to me, why don't you Google a phrase from it and see what comes up? And I'm like, why didn't I think of that? So, on the right you see a book by an Englishman named Charles White. It came out in 1846. It's called Three Years in Constantinople, or Domestic Manners of the Turks in 1844. Um, these two books are word for the word the same. <laughs> um, the one published by Isaac Edrahi has the, one, the, the much thinner book by his uh, father attached to the back of it. But the first, I don't know, 400 pages or so is actually entirely somebody else's. <laughs> By the way, it has Isaac Edrahi's uh, note to the reader at the front, followed by a, his preface to the American edition, which is more or less a paraphrase of Charles White's introduction to the, to the second edition of his book. Um, let's see. <laughs> ah, so, uh, Karen, next. Um, there was a man named Albert Fry, and he wrote a book of nicknames of people. And he had an entry called The Spanish Jew of Alicant. And in it, he describes Edrahi as he was in Boston in the early 1860s. Edrahi was a very eccentric man and claimed to be a Turkish Jew and dressed somewhat like a Turk. He would sometimes prostrate himself at full length upon the ground and on the soil, kiss it, 
and say to the surprised beholders that this was a Turkish custom. So you see, we have a very dramatic, even histrionic person. In fact, practically every description of him describes the way he moves, um, saying that he was stalking among the piazzas or promenading. Um, he had a way that was intended to make an impression. Um, and in case we're getting confused with all of his guises here, I've charted it out for you. Um, Allegro Ventura, I'm not, I didn't include him before because it could be a different Turkish merchant that happened to be in Cambridge, England at that time carrying the same kind of merchandise in the same market. You never know. Um, but these are all the different possibilities. <laughs> we'll get into some of them a little later. All right. Um, Now, we're getting towards the Civil War. We don't know what Isaac Edrahi thought of the war between the states. Um, but we do know that one particular aspect of it caught his attention. There were kinds of soldiers that were called Zouaves. They were in, initially, these were North African natives who fought for the French in, um, in North African uh, legions. And because of their exotic costume and because they were thought of as very, um, very brave, they caught on. And then there became, in later decades, Zouave units for military purposes, first in Europe and then in the United States. So volunteers, some volunteers in the north, um, w there were created some Zouave units where people would dress roughly like that. And they were caught by the romance of being the, of, of emulating these North African soldiers. Um, you can see why Isaac Edrahi might find, found this a bit appealing. Um, before we continue with that, you will see why I told you that. Back to Longfellow. Um, he is now starting work on his Tales of a Wayside Inn. And um, having worked on it a little bit, he decides to visit the inn himself. So Rich is going to read from Longfellow's diary his visit to the inn. October ends with a delicious Indian summer day. Drive with fields to the old Howe Tavern in Sudbury. Alas, no longer an inn. A lovely valley. The winding road shaded by grand old oaks before the house. A rambling, tumble-down old building, 200 years old until now in the family of the Howes who have kept an inn for 175 years. In the old time, it was a house of call for all travelers from Boston westward. Now that was October 31st, 1862. As it turned out, on that exact same date, um, uh, an article appears in the Jewish Messenger in New York City. And it states in short, that a man, a messenger from Morocco has arrived raising money for the plight of the Moroccan Jews who are being held in, imprisoned, um, including Chief Rabbi Edrahi. Um, and his son is now visiting New York raising money for the liberation of the Moroccan Jews. And it says that he is already in receipt of various donations but that they're going to, they, he's received a request for his papers to be checked out and updated. Um, meanwhile, he's taken those donations and he has skipped, I mean, left town, and he's uh, continued on his way, uh, no longer the, the Moroccan Jew, but doing, uh, going elsewhere. And here we have a report, um, something that he evidently planted in the newspaper in Newburyport, Massachusetts. A stranger on a strange business. Last Wednesday, a fine-looking gentleman with a turban upon his head was passing on State Street. Upon inquiry, we learned that he was an Arab, a native of Morocco, and a follower of the Great Prophet. He was selling books and amulets. The amulet, he says, is a berry that grows upon a tree in a botanic garden on Mount Lebanon near Jerusalem and has been used in the four quarters of the globe as a preventive of cholera, scarlet fever, and other contagious disease. 
Mr. Edrahi has this advertisement gratis. He appeared in every way a gentleman of manly form, good intellect, and considerable culture. <laughs> Evidently, he had a way with words because this went viral as well. This was, was picked up in several other newspapers, which must have delighted him end endlessly, mainly because he didn't have to pay for it. Um, then, for whatever reason, he headed back to conclude business in New York City. And we get an article actually in the New York Times called Arrest of an Imposter. <laughs> um, let me go back to that Zouave picture. I can't resist. About two months ago, an Israelite giving his name as Monsieur Edrehi and wearing the full uniform of a captain in a French Zouave regiment arrived in the city and attracted a great deal of attention by his appearance. Almost every day promenading Broadway in his gay uniform. He introduced himself to the most prominent Jews in the city and represented that he had just arrived from Algeria, where the regiment to which he claimed to be attached was stationed. Okay, and then he was delegated to make, make uh, um, collections. The soldier told his piteous story in such a manner and was supplied with such apparently genuine credentials that he met with greater success than he could have anticipated. The Jews received the delegate from Morocco very kindly, threw their houses open to his visits, and contributed liberally to the object of his journey. In a short time, Monsieur Adrehi collected over $3,000. Back then. Back then, it was a lot. Um, but as they said, they had, they had asked him to uh, update his papers, and meanwhile, they had made some inquiries to England where people knew of the Moroccan Jewish community, and they had received word back that the um, that Edrahi's story was quote a base fabrication. Um, so then, when he returned into New York, he was summarily arrested, and uh, they say he still wears his Zouave uniform, but his states that his right name is Monsieur Messardre. Um, and so uh, he, like, if you said Monsieur Edrahi or Messardre, it's like you could almost mishear one for another. But they actually, for some reason, took his word the second time. So he was imprisoned, and he was tried under the name Massar Dre, who they thought, they thought that who was who he really was. And uh, I came across an account from the Jewish community, and it said, um, uh, the, the pseudo-missionary was brought to the notice of the officers of justice and persuaded to leave the country. <laughs> so apparently, he left the country under the name Massar Dre, and in short order, he was back in the country under the name of Isaac Edrahi. <laughs> um, so that you can keep track of where he's been. Um, <laughs> These are the places that he had residence of some length of time. He actually traveled much more widely than that, um, raising money for, uh, for the books he was uh, yeah, you know, getting subscribers to. Then I have the question of the out of the country. I don't know if he actually did go out of the country or if he managed to get out of uh, their clutches some other way. Uh, but he was back in Boston because I have a record from a synagogue in Boston that he was a synagogue member in 1864. Um, I, this is the temple which these days is now Temple Israel. It was an Orthodox synagogue back then. And um, I talked to the archivist. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to come up with the papers from that back then. I was like, come on, anything? Because it's, oh, the website said there are boxes. I, I was really after her. I probably antagonized her. <laughs> anyway, um, no, she was very nice about it. Uh, but I said, come, you know, they have this list, this membership list that, 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 that he's on. I said, um, Look on the fundraising committee. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's, those are the many places that he lived. Um, and so then, as time went on, he toned down his act. He didn't travel quite as much. Um, when he came back, he uh, was a doctor. He must have gone to medical school while he was in, in Europe. Um, well, come on, actually, to be fair, they didn't have the same sense of, uh, same need for credentials back then. Anybody could set themselves up as a doctor. And uh, so he was a, a doctor in, um, in Nashville, and he gave some lectures. Um, and uh, he seemed to maintain his Turkish 
um, identity more and more as years went on. I think he was a Moroccan mainly because his father was a Moroccan and he was selling his father's books, so for consistency, he had to have that identity. The more he was on his own and away from his father, the more he seemed to enjoy uh, his Turkish identity. In fact, 1876, the Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition, um, he was uh, described by a correspondent from Janesville, Wisconsin, who had gone all that way to see the exhibits, who devoted an entire paragraph to describing her conversation with him. Uh, now, she has just described the Turkish cafe and bazaar at the exhibition. Jessica? Just outside sits an old Turk dressed in full Turkish costume. This is Dr. I. Edrahi, who has the honor to announce to the public that he has for sale an excellent article called Amulets. He takes out a chain, holds it up, and says, smell them. The odor is very pleasant, but the Tunisian boy told me privately that the old man perfumed the amulets and that it was not everlasting as he represented. And that's the last I hear of him other than on the 1880 census that he answered that um, he is a doctor of some sort. I believe that says research doctor off on the right. And where it says his place of origin, he puts Turkey. And with a bit of revisionism where he, in the, the second uh, section, that's his father's place of origin, Turkey, and his mother's place of origin, Turkey. Um, and then he actually dies four years later in Philadelphia. And here's his death certificate. And this is the only time we have any claim that he was uh, from Amsterdam. So evidently, his wife had the last word. <laughs> um, so now we have a look at what sort of person he was and what sorts of things he did. I don't think I have to label it. I think you can come to your own conclusions. Um, but uh, he seems like such an outlier. And you would think he was such an original you didn't know anything about his father. Um, his father was from Morocco. He came as a very young man to study at a yeshiva, a Jewish center of learning in London, traveled all around Europe, and was raising money for publishing his works. Um, this is a picture of him uh, when he was, I guess, about 50 years old. And I don't know if he would have had so, so much success if he had maintained this, this portrait on his business card, he decided rather to go with this one. Um, and I think almost on the strength of that absolutely wonderful business card and his habit of, of circulating with people in the upper crust, he um, was uh, quite, had received quite a following. He was a very well man, no, known man around town. He was caricatured. He was written up. And sometimes, it, often it was in a bit sarcastic ways. Um, Van Skoik, who wrote Characters and Tales of a Wayside Inn, went into him a bit, but the sarcasm completely went by him. He seems to have been a rather pure soul and didn't realize that people, to some extent, were making fun of him, his, his, his use and abuse of a number of languages. They, they parodied how he would speak and, and, and so on. Um, so as I said, he would circulate around. And this is the same business card up above. Um, and it was from a commonplace book that's a sort of an autograph album held by somebody in England. These were um, a family of artists. And uh, you see they had him below his um, business card. They had him autograph it. And um, his English is not quite up to snuff. Um, and that's only of note because he claimed to be an author. Um, and his signature at the bottom, note it's both in English and in Arabic. Sometimes he signed it in Hebrew. At, in, as well. Now, I don't know if you'll be able to see this. There's a very faint shadow. Do you see over on this side, there's something that's as if it's been erased? It's in somebody else's handwriting. And I can see it well enough to make out. It says, a fine specimen from a professor. <laughs> it's their ironic comment on, on, his, on his English, I think. Um, so I had a real dilemma figuring out what sort of person he was, because on one point, in one hand, I've come across some websites that list him among the great rabbis and travelers and travel writers. He's cited widely. And on the other hand, some contemporaries talk about him 
be selling cigars and doing a, a, a wide variety of this and that. Um, and I couldn't quite make sense of the, t of the two. But meanwhile, what I'd heard of him and what I'd heard of Isaac, a word kept buzzing around my head, a Yiddish word. And Yiddish very rarely buzzes in my head because I don't know much of it. And I kept pushing it out of my head because there's, they were Spanish. They were Sephardic Jews. Yiddish is a, a language of the Ashkenazic Jews, the other folks. And so I was like, it couldn't apply. But the word that kept buzzing around my head was the word schnorr. <laughs> Does anyone, anyone know this word? Right. A schnorr is like a kind of a, a beggar with an attitude, right? You probably know in Fiddler on the Roof, at one point a beggar comes up to the wealthy man and he asks for money and the, 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 the man gives him a kopeck and he looks at it rather critically and he says, one kopeck? You gave me two kopecks last week. And the rich man says, yes, but this week I had a rough week. And um, the, the beggar says, because you had a rough week, I should suffer. <laughs> That's a schnorr. So I looked up Schnorrer and I came up a number of entries from turn of the century around 1900 that talked about that as the economic conditions got worse and worse for the Jews throughout the 1800s, that more and more Jews were out of work and um, had to resort to all sorts of ways of making money and that there were more and more Jewish beggars and some of them were of the Schnorrer variety and they actually subdivided it into varieties of Schnorrers and then there were, there were the Schnorrers who had had fires and they traveled from city to city because they had lost their possessions and were asking for money. There were Schnorrers who had tried to become rabbis but their academics weren't good enough so they had been sent on their way from their communities with letters of recommendation, true or spurious, and they were going around uh, professing some level of knowledge um, short of being a rabbi. Um, and there was what they called the literary schnorrer, whose goal was to foist his questionable literary works upon some um, unappreciative but wealthy patron. Um, and the descriptions were, were frighteningly close to what I had seen in, in Isaac's father and then to some extent in Isaac when he brought this behavior to America. Um, I was even more struck because I came across, following up this interest in Schnorrerhood, um, a book by Israel Zangwill. He was an English author and wrote, wrote around the late 1800s, and he wrote a book called The King of Schnorrers. And again, I was expecting something very um, Yiddish in character because Schnorrer is a Yiddish word. But it turns out the King of Schnorrers was um, a Sephardic man who lived in London around the time that Isaac's father lived there and belonged to the same synagogue. Uh, um, the, uh, the similarities are absolutely remarkable. Uh, now, this is a work of fiction. He claims that he drew upon a number of things that he had heard about that community. And of course, it did not bear any resemblance to anybody real. Um, and it may not be him, but if it's not him, then he was one of a number of people of that class of which he would, be, would have been rather typical. So in either case, he's mighty close to a schnorrer in my opinion. Um, so that was, uh, that was, and it's quite an amusing book. If you choose to read it, it's short, it's very funny. It has almost the feel of um, Mark Twain to it, only about schnorrers. Um, so uh, what Moses Edrahi was banking on was that actually that there was some level of feeling towards Jews in the Christian community that he could capitalize on. Um, there was a legend called the wandering Jew. You probably know it as a phrase, just a phrase or maybe as a plant. Um, <laughs> you know, the plant that keeps growing and is hard to kill off, you know. Um, but uh, there was a legend in the Middle Ages called the wandering Jew and supposedly the wandering Jew was a man who insulted Jesus was when he was on the cross, and because of that, he was, uh, um, he was cursed to wander the earth until the second coming. And some people even believe this, you would have sightings of the wandering Jew and depictions of him in art. Um, there were even a number of books called The Wandering Jew. One of them was read by Longfellow in the 1850s. Um, it was by a Frenchman called Eugène Sue, called The Wandering Jew, and it was even made into a board game. <laughs> the French board game. <laughs> so the, the idea of the wandering Jew was very compelling. It was a known thing. So when you had 
Uh, Moses Edra, he who also dressed in traditional, he dressed in traditional Moroccan robes, and he made some claims about being, knowing about the 10 tribes and investigating them, and he was traveling from city to city. People saw in him um, a sort of a, a prototype, sort of like the wandering Jew. Here's a close up of that same thing. And now we see, here's an engraving from an early edition of Tales of a Wayside Inn. And you can guess which one would be Isaac Edrahi. You see, sitting down on the right, um, long beard, um, a cloak, and a walking staff. That's very much in a wandering Jew image. Um, now, you might wonder, um, since Isaac came out with this book in Boston, did Longfellow, in fact, ever see it? People speculated you know, with the, long, the account of the long flowing beard. That wasn't Isaac. That sounded like his father. And all the stuff about the tales, maybe Longfellow actually saw Isaac's book. Maybe you know, Isaac succeeded in selling it to him. Well, I called Longfellow House um, in Cambridge. And they have Longfellow's original book collection. And I asked them. And there it is. That is the, the book, the book about Asia that has, if you look in the middle of the spine, it says, um, including the history of the 10 tribes by Dr. Edrahi. So um, Isaac Edrahi did, did succeed in selling his book. It's a Longfellow. And it actually does have Longfellow's book plate in it. Um, and inside we see that there's the, um, the picture of Isaac Edrahi. Now you're probably trying to make out that writing on top. Um, one of the archivists there verified that is Longfellow's writing. And to go in closer, it says, the Jew of Alicant in Tales of a Wayside Inn. Not really from Alicant, but a native of Morocco. <laughs> to which we can add, not really from Morocco, but his dad was. Um, and later in the book, facing the section on the 10 tribes that his father really wrote, actually I have some doubts on that, but that's a subject for another um, he wrote at least some of it, maybe. Um, <laughs> subject for a different lecture um, of less local interest. Anyway, so there's the picture of his father. So we know that Longfellow um, bought the book, and he actually saw those. And I didn't reproduce it. But a number of pages in the, the, his father's legends, um, they, are, uh, they have pencil, uh, Longfellow's pencils marks along the side, um, highlighting areas of interest. So we know that Longfellow actually did uh, look at this book. So now we know, um, well now you know what I know, and uh, you can form your opinion from that. I just want to make a couple of concluding points. I mean obviously Isaac Edrahi was a very peculiar charismatic man. Um, but despite his many questionable, highly questionable escapades, he did have the power to inspire others' imaginations. Um, Remember that depressed painter in Florence? And, um, and Longfellow himself, who was pulling it together to, to write tales of a wayside in, he had a way of catching people's uh, um, attention and really firing their imaginations about things. And he was a perfect storyteller, so no wonder that Longfellow thought to um, replicate him in his book. Um, in the broader sense, um, the Spanish Jew fu functioned as a cultural intermediary allowing Longfellow not only to deal with American stories and European stories, but to broaden out to the traditional Jewish and Middle Eastern and even Far Eastern stories, because he wanted it to be um, a poem that brought together many cultures and showed that people from different groups could sit together and appreciate each other's literature and cultures. Um, so Longfellow's portrayal of Isaac Edrahi was visually similar to Isaac and to some extent to his father. Um, and it even had the aroma of the East. And now we know it, where he got, got it from, those, those amulets, right? And his otto of roses. Um, but the similarity stops there. Um, I think, though, how much did Longfellow know about Edrahi's doings? I mean, he had some sense. He must have noticed something going on. Um, he didn't underline anything in the first part of the book, the first 400 pages that was an unrelated book about Turkey. I think he got the idea. I don't think he knew about the escapades um, fundraising in, 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 uh, in New York City. I don't think he knew that he was jailed in England. Um, he took the best that Edrahi had to offer 
he made something of that and he left the rest aside, which I would say was a remarkable case of pro-Semitism. We hear a lot about anti-Semitism, right? Just like in the newspapers, you hear the bad news, you don't hear the good news. Let's give credit to Longfellow for, for a stellar act of pro-Semitism. Now, of course, if you're being pro-Semitic, it's not necessarily any more accurate than being anti-Semitic, but at least it's a lot more benevolent. Um, now, uh, in the tales, uh, when the friends are discussing, they discuss a lot of things about literature, and they discuss whether one of the tales is true. The, t the storyteller says, oh, it was true, and one of them says, no, it's just a story, and then they're going back and forth and getting a little upset about it, and um, the Spanish Jew breaks in, and he comments, the, of tr the, the cloak of truth is lined with lies. Interesting that Longfellow should have him, of all people, say that. Well, we know that the real editor, he certainly lined his cloak, um, and so did Longfellow in his way. Um, he was promoting a literary truth, even when it was not literally true, um, as with Edri Edri what he did with Edrihi's character. Now, I would say the Tales of a Wayside Inn is, um, above all, it's a, um, it's a civilized work. Really, um, because you have these people who are from different places, a broader variety of people than would commonly have gathered back then. And in an atmosphere of trust, they're exploring each other's heritage. And you know, when people start talking about their backgrounds and their national literatures and setting that up to be critiqued, and they did critique quite, in a quite a spirited way, that um, can raise tempers a bit. And people, they, um, they weren't just being civilized in some um, very bland, polite way where people just stay off of topics that might cause any anxiety. They were really getting into each other's literature and, and sometimes they would claim that each other's things were worthless and, and be, have a real back and forth about it. But bottom line, there was the trust that they all enjoyed each other's company. They could, they could take it. And so to me, that was really what was civilization and what it needed to be. Back then, remember the Civil War is going on and this is Longfellow's way of saying, no matter how different people are, we can just all um, be together, we can discuss our cultures, and it can all be part of what this country is. Um, so, uh, oh, I mentioned Zangwill. He was the one who wrote the book about Schnorrers. He also was the one who popularized the term the melting pot. He wrote a play, and it caught on in the United States. And uh, the term the melting pot doesn't come from then, but that's what, when it began, began to become identified with uh, US immigration. But I would say that Longfellow's ideal was not that of a melting pot, not that everybody would pour in their own backgrounds and all be fused into some sort of ident identical thing. Um, his uh, his um, idea was really much more like, the ideal was the an anthology, that uh, all the people coming to the United States brought their stories and they contributed, and that America was a collection of stories, or maybe that w we were all a bunch of people um, gathered together um, in the parlor, and uh, this, is what, um, this was what America was all about. Um, now, just a couple of uh, questions that remain. Um, did Edrihi ever come to Sudbury? Did he ever come to the Wayside Inn? Not as far as I can determine. Um, maybe that's a good thing. If he had stayed at the Wayside Inn, he probably wouldn't have paid his bill. <laughs> um, and did Edrihi know that he had been made into the Spanish Jew? Evidently, he worked a lot with bookstores and the, the book selling and his publicizing his lectures. He seemed to have been a rather well-read well person, not, not only by his own admission, a man of culture. Um, but he never capitalized on his identity. And we wonder why that is. I think it's somewhat likely that if you know, he was featured by name as a character in a work by the premier poet of the age, he would have known about it. Maybe he didn't. If he did, he chose not to, to, uh, to use it. I think if he had lectured and said, um, you know, I'm lecturing as the Spanish Jew from Longfellow, he would have gotten quite a reaction. It would have allowed him to be in costume and yet be true to his own heritage. Um, if he had that opportunity, he chose not to use it. Maybe he didn't want um, an identity foisted upon him by somebody else. Um, maybe he was so much ingrained in his Turkish identity um, that he was pursuing at the time that he didn't want to take it on. 
But goodness knows he could have made quite a living at it with the popularity of Longfellow. And so for whatever reason he didn't um, take advantage of that, perhaps I guess we could just call that poetic justice. <laughs> so thank you. I would uh, very much like to hear your questions. Thank you, Joyce. That was so interesting. I love that word schnorrer. I just <laughs> love it. Um, so, questions. Does, um, would any comments? Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, I, was, I was, would just like to, to remark that, that uh, it seems that, that he, Mr. Edrichie's persona uh, fit in very well with European 19th century and 20th century Orientalism. Uh, as a whole, as a literary movement, and as an artistic movement, and indeed as a musical movement. Um, uh, at the same time, Orientalist literature and Orientalist paintings, especially of Delacroix, of, of, of Moroccan Jews, the Moroccan Jewish wedding, and, and harem scene after harem scene after harem scene. And I think what he's doing is he's capitalizing off, off the image of, of the, the Orientalized Easterner um, in uh, the West, and of course, this this um, uh, uh, orientalization of Sephardic Jews in particular continues far into the 20th century and indeed into our own day. Um, we still come across orientalized um, uh, uh, accounts of, of, of Sephardic Jews in both American and Israeli and European media. That's an absolutely gorgeous point, and actually that was something that was in my notes that I kind of forgot to make. You said it far better than I could, and that, that's totally, totally to the point. I'm kind of intrigued. Moses Edrahi was almost anticipating that, the father. Um, by, by acting that way in the very, very early 1800s, I think he was maybe even preceding that movement. But yes, there was a huge amount of curiosity about people from far away, and particularly from the Orient. These were the days of the Ottoman Empire. These images mm. of harem scenes and such became very popular in art. And absolutely, um, Moses and later Isaac were completely playing into that. That's, that's a wonderful point. Right, right. In fact, they were just starting to have relations. The first uh, consulate, um, the first uh, um, ambassador from, uh, um, from Turkey was in the 1840s, um, no, eight, late 1830s. And so, yes, this absolutely all goes together. It's a beautiful point, yeah. Um, yes, just following up on that point, another famous portrait of someone in Oriental dresses Lord Byron from about that period. I don't know if you're I've familiar with that. I've heard about that. Yeah, I'll have to take, I'd love to take yeah, a look at that. Yeah, he's got a turban and robes and everything, and I think you're right. That, that was a very popular style of... of, of the question I had, though, um, relates to the, the portrait, the one at the Wayside Inn in the, in the Von Schaik book. Uh, I don't know if you can put that back up there, but... Um, um, the one of the... In oh, the... Uh, yes. Yes, on the left, uh, <laughs> above his head, he's got a... a an emblem. It's it's a, a crescent moon and a lion. It looks like, and and w your almost last slide where it's in the frontispiece of his father's book, um, it doesn't have that. It just has the picture of him. I don't know if that means anything. If that symbol was supposed to I indicate. I did. I did look anything. into it. Um, if anybody has any feelings about that symbol ab above his head, let me know. The most I can make out is that it's a hybrid that perhaps he concocted himself. The uh, crescent was then the symbol of the Ottoman Empire, and the, um, the lion in that position was um, on the coat of arms of Morocco. So I think it was his way of m combining the Moroccan background and the Turkish background, both in his own identity and in that cobbled together book, which was about Turkey and then had the bit in the back from his, his father in Morocco. And that was very astute. You notice that it appears in some and not others. I took this to the, uh, I pointed that out to the people at the American Antiquarian Society in um, Worcester and talked to somebody very knowledgeable and she said, oh yeah, evidently that symbol was a later edition. It was put on after the book was printed and so, so like some copies, ha early copies didn't have it and later copies did have it. And apparently Longfellow was in possession of one of the early copies. Nice observation. More, please more. Are, there, Are you saying yeah, enough, enough? Yes. Thanks. I was just going to comment that uh, I thought the observation about the uh, 
to paraphrase the Oriental gentleman, uh, you know, the intrigue, the culture, etc., was very well made. And I was only going to say that you're in the earlier pictures where you say, "Does this guy look like this guy?" Um, not to, not to throw rain, but I think that that was a. I'm trying to think of a contemporary example, but I mean, it's it's sort of. You know, as if someone has a, uh, a French accent in Harvard Square and starts saying that, you know, there's some sophistication or scholarship behind him. I think at that time, um, you probably would have found in, in many American cities uh, or European cities people who affected a, a certain mode of dress uh, or even uh, facial appearance uh, to, to enhance commerce. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. I tried to look up, you know, things like Turkish merchant, Moroccan merchant, and see if I came up with ones who weren't Edrihi. Um, and I actually didn't come up with a whole lot of them. Um, but I'd be very interested to know how many of them did. Another thing, the question that intrigues me is, gosh, you know, how would people in the Muslim community feel about this? Um, from what I can tell, in the 1800s, there wasn't much of a Muslim community. Bef um, it was just very, very sparse occasional travelers. How did they feel about this guy who was actually Jewish, who went around, probably interacted with tens of thousands of people over his career, passing himself off as an Arab and a Muslim? That's what makes me squirm. Yes? Just a moment. You're surprised? You're surprised because of his being an Arab? Mm -hmm. I mean, this, but we as Arabs uh, have. Uh, uh, for a long, long time, up till, up till the, uh, the uh, formation of this Jewish state, we have always considered Jews as Arabs. They were never a, a religion. I mean, only. You know, you can be Muslim, you can be Christian, you can be, you can be Jew, but you are an Arab because it's in the culture. And we have a prominent, prominent um, a Jewish uh, poet who actually has a wonderful saying as to how proud the Arabs are of their language, of their, of their heritage, of their, you know, of their um, um, connection to the Arab world. It's amazing. So we never had this view that the Jews are a different race. They were actually, you know, the Jews in Arab, the Arab world were Arabs. Right, very, very interesting. No, but what about, what about him claiming to be Muslim? Well, actually, yeah, this, this is another thing. See, actually, with the Muslim, uh, um, the, the formation, uh, the, uh, when the introduction of the Muslim religion in the Arab world, people became much more... Um, uh, yeah, it, um, the, the religion being uh, originally uh, in Arabic, you know, the, the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad actually had his his teachings in Arabic, and the Quran is written in Arabic, beautiful Arabic. And Arabic language was ma the main attraction for the people to become Muslims, because it was written so beautifully, so marvelously, that that was actually the miracle of the Quran. It was the Arabic language. And in those days, they, they had a lot of Jews in the uh, in the uh, in the Hijaz and Najd, where now it's Saudi Arabia, they, we we always had the Jews in our in our culture, in our people, in, uh, and they where there was so much inter interacting with the Muslims, uh, and you know having um, having lived in the same area, in the same place, they've uh, uh, you can you know, it's very hard to distinguish between people because they they have so much heritage that goes back far away in history. Mm in that area. And it actually makes a characteristic of, you know, they, they become, they, they have a character to them. I, w I was telling my, my sister today, you know, we're talking, and I said, you know, you have a feel, you know, uh, uh, there's a feeling uh, uh, towards people who come from the same place. There's so much that becomes common for the people other than religion. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Are there over here. Uh, one other thing to look at, which does actually involve Sudbury and involves Longfellow, is this was the hotbed of the American missionary movement to the Middle East. 
uh, beginning in about 1805, and it extended from Cambridge. The missionaries, uh, when they returned, lived sort of from Cambridge out, mostly in Newton, and all the way out into Sudbury. Longfellow was very involved with, with some of that movement. Uh, and far more than the Orientalist movement, it was, it's the American Missionary Movement, which started uh, in Morocco really? and yeah, went all that. around the Mediterranean. Uh, and uh, most notably, Pliny Fisk, um, who, I bu who, who was there through the 1860s, um, first arrived, I think, in 1812. But there were quite a large number of people in this area who were involved in the American movement a missionary movement in the Middle East. And in addition, Longfellow was involved in the uh, American Hellenic movement, the number one debated foreign policy topic in the U.S. Congress up through 1825 was the Greek Revolution against the Ottoman Empire. Mm -hmm. So that's another area I think you could look into. Interesting. Thank you. Oh. Any other comments about this wonderful talk? Thank you so much, Joyce. That was really most interesting. Um, I do want to um, just say a few words about um, our, our newsletter. And I hope that all of you have, can you hear this? Is it taking up? Um, all of you will pick up a copy. And if you're members, please put your name down, because we won't have to mail it to you um, and save postage in that way. But it is, um, we haven't had one for about three years, and Peggy Fredrickson wrote this. Thank you very much, Peggy. Um, and it tells a lot about what the society is up to right now. Um, we're actually going to be pro very likely losing our space on um, the second floor of Town Hall, uh, because the, uh, the town would like to convert this into office space. So we are therefore going to be looking, we're actively looking for some other place to go. And uh, in the meantime, what we're doing is um, reorganizing what we have up, up there and um, putting some order to it so that it will become an exhibit uh, space so that you all can come up and, and see, uh, some, you know, see what we have in, in, in a nice, ordered way. And I think you'll, you'll, like, you'll enjoy that. We have a goal of, of, of uh, next fall for that. But, but keep... Um, You'll hear more and more about the fact that we're looking for a museum, and I, I, I hope that you'll uh, continue to be interested in that. Now, <laughs> it would have to be a very large home, how it, Terry. Now, refreshments are, now I really know why you asked for Turkish delights and so on. Um, there is a, a Middle Eastern theme to our refreshments today. Um, so you'll find there dates and hummus and olives and apricots and Turkish delights, which are candies there. And um, what else? Macaroons and matzah candy with halva. So anyway, uh, and, and then the usual things. So enjoy. Thank you.